1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse number 1. The scripture reads, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which you also stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the word of the Lord. And the church said, amen. Amen. I want to preach from the topic, this is the good news. This is the good news. You may be seated. Holy Spirit, I thank you for this opportunity to stand before your people. It's a good day. One, because we're alive and we're breathing. And it's an even greater day because we're recognizing what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. Make it real for us today. We thank you that we are alive in Christ. We serve a risen Savior. And by the time we're done today, after we've gotten into this word, may we truly be transformed from the inside out. This we pray in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, amen. This Friday, I was speaking with a group of people. It's a pretty diverse group of people, intergenerational. And most of them were baby boomers. And I shared with them that um, I'm a millennial, but I'm on the older end of the millennials. We got any older millennials? See, millennials, we get to the point where we start saying stuff like, I'm too old for that. (laughs) You know, you're an older millennial when you look at the stuff that Gen Z does, you say, they need to get somewhere and sit down. Be careful, you might just be an older millennial. When you start talking about the good old days and the way it used to be, you just might be an older millennial. But what's special about being an older millennial is that I was born in 1983, so half my life has been digital, and the first half of my life was analog. When you're an elder millennial, you remember some things. And I have no problem with technology, embracing Wi-Fi, but I remember when you had to dial up. Gen Z, let me tell you something. The internet was not always available. It wasn't always readily accessible. You weren't always able to connect to it wirelessly. You had to get to a computer that was connected to a modem And if you wanted to get online, you had to dial up. Anybody remember the sound of that modem? And this was before everybody was talking on cell phones, so you had that house phone, you had one line. And while you were dialing up on the internet, nobody else could get on the phone line. You wanted to get on the internet, and then you got on there, you got a busy signal, and you yelled up to your sister, get off the phone, I'm trying to to go online. I remember the analog days versus the digital days. I also remember when television used to go off the air. Back in the day when television was furniture. Back when they used to polish the television. Anybody grew up and they used to take pledge and (laughs) wipe it off, get get a nice shine on it. Anybody ever hit their head against the television? Furniture, they had the big, and like if you had like a 20 inch screen, like you were balling. And that that TV used to sit in the corner and it had physical buttons. So if you wanted to change the channel, they didn't really have remote controls, they had you. So going up there and change that channel, put it on channel 13. And then if you wanted a good signal, you had what they call bunny ears, antennas that would stick out, and, and depending on the signal, you had to kind of move it. And I don't know why we put foil on it. And while you're watching your television program, if you were the child, they would say, okay, go up there, move it, move it. All right, stay right there, don't move. And it had very kind of strict television programming, and there was a point in the middle of the night where television would sign off. Every station, television would sign off. They would do what they call their call signal. They would announce 
the call station. This is WNVIM signing off on 400 megahertz power headquartered in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Good day and good night. Then they would play the Star Spangled Banner. You see a flag waving. <laughs> then after they're done, in the land of the free, the home of the brave. And you knew it was time to go to bed. But then there was cable. And then came satellite. And then came hundreds of options in terms of television. And then emerged what we call the 24-hour news cycle. See, with analog television, you had certain times where you watched the news in the morning before you went to work. You watched the news in the evening before dinner. But cable presented an opportunity to create what we call news networks. And so even in the early 80s, CNN emerged as the first 24-hour news station. And it kind of revolutionized the news because instead of waiting for the news in the morning and the evening, it was an entire channel centered around news. And here's the thing about the news. In order to get views, they decided to make news entertaining. So now it's not just the nightly news. you now got talk shows in the evening that discuss current events with comedy. And then you have opinion-based shows. And the crazy thing is now when it came to the news, it wasn't about what was right. It was about who was first. You had this concept of breaking news. And in breaking news, everybody was rushing to get their news out before the other station. I remember watching that big television made out of furniture, made out of wood. We were watching the NBA Finals, and the Rockets were playing. And in the middle of the Rocket game, breaking news, O.J. Simpson. And so we're watching TV, but now the news has descended in the midst of the basketball game, and we're watching that white Bronco traveling down the highway. And then there was this obsession, and everywhere you turned... Because now news have become entertainment. But here's what I need you to understand. Statistically speaking, according to Quora, 90% of the news across all formats is negative. Because now that news is entertainment, it plays on the worst of our being. Because psychologically speaking, we are wired to give more importance to bad news over good news. So we call negativity bias. It is this idea that we tend to give more importance uh, to negative events versus positive events. There's something within us that loves a train wreck. And it pulls us in. And it used to be about being glued to the television set, but now there's online media. Now there's scrolling. There's a term called doom scrolling. Doom scrolling is where you hear about a negative event on the internet and now you start to research it yourself and you become overwhelmed and consumed and now you're searching different sources and there's a threat that's literally 5,000 miles away but now your mind is tapped into that negativity and now you're consumed with what if. And you find yourself overwhelmed by bad news. And what psychologists and therapists are finding is that people are dealing with more anxiety and listen to me, social media ain't helping. People are dealing with more concerns and worries, but television is not making it better. We have a world that's consumed with bad news. So here's why we're here today. Here's why we're here on a Sunday morning. Here's why we're celebrating the resurrection, because we need some good news. And let me tell you something about this good news. This good news is not dependent on what's happening in Europe. This good news is not dependent on the political election cycle. It's not dependent on who gets in the office in November. It's not dependent on your local government and what they do or don't do concerning your municipal concerns. It's not based on the economy, how good it is or how bad it is, whether inflation is going up or slowing down. This good news is based on the truth of the gospel message. That's why we're here, because we believe that there is good news that transcends the bad news. And I know what you're feeling. You're worried about what's happening in Russia, but you're also worried about what's happening on your street. You're worried about what's happening with the national economy, but you're also worried about your personal economy. You're worried about the paycheck that didn't arrive. 
You worried about the rent that's due because the first is right around the corner. Am I talking to anybody? You're dealing with relationship issues. You're dealing with problems. You're dealing with issues that are compounding around you. So not only do you have this environment where there's no good news on television and no good news online, but now you're dealing with your mind and you're doom scrolling through all your problems and all your issues. That's why it's hard for some of us to praise because in our mind, we are still going through problem after problem after problem. But let me help you understand something about coming into the presence of a risen Savior. The power of worship is that you fix your eyes on the one who can save you. That you fix your attention on the one who's greater than your problems. Worship magnifies your Lord. Worry magnifies your problems. You've got a choice. Either you're going to magnify the problems of this world, either you're going to magnify the problems of your life, or you're going to make an intentional decision to magnify the Lord. I'm here to remind you that Jesus is king. I'm here to remind you that his salvation is come. And if you can't find any good news on CNN, if you can't find it on Fox News, if you can't find it on Facebook or Instagram, you can open up this good book. This technology still works. It transcends the 80s, the 90s, the 70s, the 60s, the 40s. It's the good news of the gospel. And let me tell you, it's more relevant now than it's ever been before because what people really need is Jesus. They need Jesus. They don't want to say his name, but they need him. This world is broken. It's fallen because of sin. And we believe that the solution is found in a man named Jesus. I dare you right now on this Resurrection Sunday to just say his name, Jesus. That's one for the Father. Say his name, Jesus. That's one for the Son. Say his name, Jesus. That's one for the Holy Ghost. Surround yourself with the reality of Jesus, I found in my own life when things are going bad, I can call on the name that's greater than every other name. I can speak the name of Jesus. I may not know my next step. I may not know when the paycheck is coming. I may not know where we're going or why we're going. But one thing I do know is that Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. And he's worthy of everything I have to give him. Is there anybody here that's going to give God praise in the midst of bad news? Is there anybody that's going to declare him king in the midst of trouble, in the midst of defeat. We serve a God who is victorious. We serve a king who conquered death and the grave. The good news is that Jesus is Lord. The bad news is I don't know who's going to win the political election in November, but one thing I know is that I serve king of kings, lord of lords, and he reigns and he rules despite who's in the office. I don't serve an elephant. I don't serve a donkey. I serve the man who rose on a donkey. I serve the man who's the lion of Judah. I serve the king who's got all power in his hands. He rules. He reigns. He's still on the throne. And I'm here with a bunch of people who just crazy enough to shout out his name. Shout the name of Jesus. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Tell everybody about the God who saves you. Jesus is king. His salvation has come. Not just for you, but it's come to me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. We need some good news. Need some good news. People on your job acting crazy, remember the good news. People in your family acting strange, remember the good news. Trouble on your block, remember the good news diagnosis of cancer remember the good news you need something that man can't give you remember the good news remember the eternity of our heavenly father remember the authority of our savior jesus remember the rule remember the reign remember the good news so we need some good news the good news that jesus is king and salvation has come which is why we need the scriptures Can I share a secret with you? Every once in a while, you ought to open up your Bible. Every once in a while, you ought to turn off the TV. Can I share something with you? Every once in a while, you ought to delete the app off your phone. I'm talking about the Instagram and the Facebook. It's useful. It can be useful. I'm not against technology. but, But every now and then, we got to unplug so we can replug 
back into the word of God because when you read the scriptures, it gives you context for everything that's happening. Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other. It's the good news that outweighs the bad news. And the good news is found in the text. So today we find comfort in the scripture. The apostle Paul is talking to the church at Corinth and this is what he says in verse one. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which you also stand, by which also you are saved. If, somebody say if, if. you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Now, here's the thing about importance and the concept of priority. If something is important, then something else is less important. I need you to understand that in the kingdom of God, part of being successful and following Jesus is putting first things first. And so this is telling us this is what's important. Listen, I love gathering. I, I love the lights and I love the LED wall, but that's not why we grow. We grow because we put first things first. The gospel is at the center of our community. We all look good today. Everybody looks fly. Fit check. You're looking good, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is the gospel. This is the first importance, and he's going to spell it out. What I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Somebody say, according to the scriptures. We got to get back to the place where we live according to the scriptures. We've got to get back to the place where we trust in the scriptures. We've got to get back into the place where we stand on the authority of the scriptures. It's the scriptures that bring us the good news and the salvation. It's the scriptures that correct us when we lose our way. Is there anybody that's ever lost your path? Come on, you can be honest. We're here because we serve a risen Savior who's rich with mercy and love and compassion. And if you're honest, we all have the propensity to stray, to, to, to veer from the path. And it's the word of God. God that brings us back, which is why some of you are here now, and I get it, you haven't been to service in a long time, and the word is going forth to bring you back. You needed the scriptures to bring you back. You need the word to bring you back so that you can go from being victim to becoming victorious. The victory is found in the scriptures, and we see that in the gospel message. Here are three key components of the gospel message. Number one, that Jesus is God. Oh my goodness, Jesus is Lord. He's not just a man, he's king. He's not just a prophet, he is God. He's not just a good man according to the scriptures. He's not a myth. He's not a fairy tale. We're here because we believe that Jesus is real. We're here because we believe that he is the son of God, that he is co-equal with the father, that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We're here because we believe that he is 100% divine and 100% human. It's the mystery of the divine wrapped in the human body, that, that, that he is historical. He entered into history and he made claims to be the son of God. There are other religions that try to pin him as a prophet he's more than a prophet to us he is God he is God he is God Jesus is God they don't mind you talking about Jesus in terms of social justice but when you start calling him Lord and you start calling him Savior and you start calling him God people get uncomfortable because if he's God that means he's ruler if he's ruler that means you bow down when he comes to town if he's king that means you have to change some things in your life to conform to his kingdom if he's king that means that he rules over us and nobody wants a Lord over them in today's culture people think that they are God be careful hanging around people who want to claim that you're gods and little gee gods the devil is a liar there's only one God one Lord one faith one baptism and Jesus Christ is God that's the gospel message that he is God and secondly that he died on the cross for our sins the reason why we have so much bad news in the earth today is because of the reality of sin. Sin causes death, not just the death of individuals and people. There's an environment of death. We live in a fallen world. If you ever wonder why bad things happen to good people, it's because of the reality of sin. People do sinful things. People do wicked things. People do evil things. And then there's an unseen world that we can't see where there's an adversary named Satan. And Satan takes advantage of the flesh of people and the 
the sin nature that's within them. But I need you to know that we serve a Savior who died for our sins. He died on the cross to deal with the sin issue. The only way to come before a holy God is to be holy. We cannot be holy on our own effort. So Jesus became sin for us so that we can become righteous. That's what we believe that his blood was shed because there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. So Jesus died for us so that we can be reconciled with the Father. We believe that he died for our sins. As the final sacrifice, his blood was shed. And third, we believe that he rose on the third day. So this man who claimed to be God gave his life on the cross, but he didn't stay in the tomb. He got up, thus proving that he was indeed God. The resurrection is a miracle, and we believe in that miracle. That miracle is not metaphorical, that it is historic, that he literally was placed in the tomb. His lifeless body was placed in the tomb, taken down from the cross. But three days later, they came to find him, and the tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. Why do you cry? He is risen. And then according to the scriptures, he appeared to people. He appeared to people and they were able to see the nail prints in his hand and the nail prints in his feet and the piercing of his side. They were able to see that he indeed lives. That's the gospel. The miracle of his virgin birth. The miracle of the fact that he gave his life and his blood was shed to remove our sins. And the miracle that he rose on the third day, which is why we're here. Because we believe that he lives. We call it Easter Sunday. We also call it Resurrection Sunday. Because we remember the resurrection. So here's what I want you to understand about the gospel. Four things and then we're done. Number one, the gospel must be preached. <clears throat> There's a reason why I'm raising my voice. Because to preach means to proclaim. See, when you're fighting a 24-hour news cycle, there's so much noise. There's so much chatter. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a podcast. Everybody has an idea. Everybody has a comment to make. But I'm here to let you know that this is the season for those who believe in the gospel to raise your voice like a trumpet and proclaim it. You ought to be willing to get a little loud for the one who saved you from your sins. That this is not a quiet gospel message. Even now some people are wondering, why does he have to make all that noise? Why does he have to make all that noise? I'm here to tell you that when that stone rolled away, Jesus made noise for me. When he was stretched out on the cross, he cried out for me. I'm here to let you know if he cried out for me on the cross, surely I can cry out for him after the resurrection surely I can make some noise and declare that my Savior lives I'm going to proclaim this gospel message you can't shut me up about it I'm not going to be silent about the name of Jesus tell your friends tell your co-workers tell your family that Jesus is alive tell somebody the good news of the gospel that Jesus loves you don't be ashamed everybody's out about everything else everybody's declaring everything else everybody's sharing their opinion about everything else can I share what I believe that Jesus is the son of God can I tell it like I feel it that he died on the cross for my sins can I declare it like I know it he rose on the third day I'm preaching now I'm proclaiming and persuading you can try all those lesser gods if you want to I know I'm sitting with the big G God with the big K King King of Kings Lord of Lords let me boast in my Lord for just a moment my God is so big so strong and so mighty there's nothing that my God cannot do yes my God's better than your God you have the right to believe what you want to believe but one thing we're not gonna do is diminish this God that I serve you believe what you believe I'm gonna believe what I believe but I ain't gonna be quiet you can't shut me up I know too much about him I know what he did for me I know that he lives within me I know that he's still moving I know him I know him I know him I know my Redeemer lives Hallelujah. High five somebody and tell them the gospel must be preached. You can't be quiet about this thing. No longer be timid. Say it with boldness. You don't have to be rude. 
but you can be clear you can raise your voice you can raise your voice and declare that Jesus is King the second thing about the gospel is that the gospel must be received somebody's got to preach it but people have to choose to receive it I'm going to preach it but you don't have to receive it but just because you don't receive it doesn't mean that it's not true the gospel method must be received to receive means to take something that is given paid or sent I can pay for your meal but you got to receive it you can reject it and still try to pay for yourself but let the record be known that I put you on my tab you chose not to receive it just because somebody gives something of value doesn't mean that somebody's gonna receive it but I'm glad that there's a population of people in here you're glad that Jesus paid it all you said thank you Lord I'll take whatever you give salvation thank you Lord I'll receive it I receive it I receive it by your stripes I am healed I receive it I'm healed from sin and the grave I receive it I was on my way to hell but salvation came knocking on my door and I said yes is there anybody here that said yes you're offering salvation Jesus one day you said yes I believe I receive it I don't understand it all but I receive it you can receive what you don't understand you can receive what you can't fully comprehend you just open up your heart and say if you're giving it to me I receive it the gospel must be received and I'm here to let you know you got some co-workers they're ready to receive the gospel don't don't let the look on their face make you think that they're not ready. They're just going through bad news, problems, trials, and tribulations. You just pray about what to say and watch the gospel change. Their life changed their facial expressions. They were just waiting for somebody to come with some truth and come with some good news. Don't fear. People are ready to receive. Economy's bad. Some people are ready to get saved. Political unrest. They need to know that their God is not a politician or a political party. They need to know that Jesus is is king. They need to know that their hope is not built on man-made things. Their hope is built on eternal things. There are people who are ready to receive the gospel. You received it, didn't you? You rejected it at first, didn't you? Some of y'all grew up in the church sleeping in the back pew. You were a drug baby, drunk to every service, afternoon service, morning service, evening service. You didn't know what you were listening to until one day the Holy Spirit hit you. One day somebody shared the gospel and it clicked. It turned on. Tears started streaming down your eyes and you said, I'm ready to receive what I formerly rejected. If God can do it for you, he can do it for your neighbor. He can do it for your family. He can do it for your friends. He can do it for your boss. He can do it for your co-workers. God works in mysterious ways. He'll show up and turn somebody's life upside down. All you gotta do is preach the gospel. Let the lion out and let him do what only he can do. So the gospel must be preached. The gospel must be received. But don't forget number three, the gospel must be lived. Now your life has got to match up with the message that you embrace. You've got to hold fast to the truth of the gospel. You've got to glue yourself to the gospel intellectually and emotionally and practically. If he lives, then my life is different. He's transformed me from the inside out. When God transforms you, you're totally different. When God gets a hold of you, you stop saying things the way you used to say them. If you get transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit God puts the super on the natural he starts to change your desires you go back to the same place but you can't do the same things you got to put yourself in some different environments because the Holy Spirit got a hold of you when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you he changes you from the inside out you go back to the hood and people look looking at you saying you different you brand new you bet I'm brand new because I've been in the presence of a living savior he'll transform you from the inside out have you talking different have you walking different have you living different the gospel must be lived is there anybody here that's ready to walk this thing out you're tired of slipping and backsliding you're making the decision today before I step into April I want to live this thing that I believe I'm here to let you know the Holy Spirit can help you in your weakness just 
let the Holy Spirit work. Let them cook. Let them cook. Let them work in your heart and watch them change your world. Let the Holy Spirit take complete control and watch them change the way you think. Watch them change the way you feel. High five somebody and tell them, get out your feelings. This ain't about your feelings, it's about truth. Your feelings will have you focus on the bad news. The truth is the good news is the good news despite the bad news. This ain't about what I feel, this is about truth. Let truth have its perfect work in your life. The gospel must be lived. And number four, this is where we are, the gospel must be celebrated. It's okay for you to lift your hands and lift your voice uh, and declare that you believe. Uh, in fact, you ought to have a praise uh, because when you think about where you were and how you used to live uh, and how crazy you were, you used to come to church crazy, just sitting there looking like something wrong with you. But then one day, the gospel got your heart and everything made sense. And now look at you. Now look at you. Look at you now. Look at you now. Look at you now. Running when nobody's chasing you. Look at you now. Dressed up not just on the outside, but clean on the inside. Look at you now. You used to be addicted, but now you believe. You're being transformed from the inside out. Look at you now. You got a reason to praise the Lord. If you got a reason, you ought to praise Him. Celebrate the change. Celebrate the transformation. Celebrate the difference. Celebrate it.